But more or less, these maps show uh, the I-84 corridor, which goes from, from Boise and stretches all the way down to uh, eastern Idaho. So from western Idaho to eastern Idaho. And what these maps show is, is some different land cover. But I'll just point out um, the incredible numbers of, de of barn owls that we were collecting. Um, and so this spot over here, um, we estimated about 1,100 to 1,300 barn owls um, were dying per year if you extended this out for 100 kilometers. Um, and so there were these hot spots where owls were just getting nailed. One day, I collected 114 dead owls over a 100 mile stretch of this highway. And so we looked at how these, these areas were um, related to different land cover and land use type, uh, median and, and shoulder uh, maintenance. And then we provided with kind of some baseline uh, idea of, of what was going on. And the numbers were just incredible. Uh, again, we estimated just, I think in the end, it was somewhere around 3,200 owls per year getting killed on this 100 mile stretch of road. And so this was kind of a first step to then what's gone on to, to try to uh, redesign the way that roads are managed and even do things like um, trying to draw owls away from the roadside. So a, a very applied conservation. It's not as it's not incredibly easy to force owls away from a road, uh, but they are the, the Idaho Department of Transportation has taken this data and moved forward with it to try to um, figure out ways to reduce this. Uh, while I was in Boise also though, I got uh, my first experience really uh, at banding birds and I worked at the Idaho Bird Observatory where I got a chance to um, band lots of really cool birds that were passing through uh, during migration right above uh, Boise, Idaho. Um, here are a few of them, here's some, some different Pidnax flycatchers, uh, black-headed grosbeaks. Um, we did some raptor trapping also, so kestrels. And I also got to meet this woman here, or this girl at the time, who eventually became my wife. She worked at the bird observatory as well, this is Emily. She's watching somewhere around there. Um, and so I then took her away from Idaho with me. Uh, we got married in the mountains of Idaho, and then we left, and we moved to East Tennessee um, to the University of Tennessee, where I decided to move on for my PhD. Um, and for this, this was really my first chance to be in charge of a project that was large and complicated. And this was a forest management experiment um, aimed at seeing, at seeing how forest management in the form of, of silviculture or, or timber harvesting uh, could be used to, to provide benefits to birds that you wouldn't really think of when you think of uh, forest management and, and especially uh, cerulean warblers. Uh, we had sites throughout the Southern Appalachians into the Central Appalachians. Um, and it was with a whole variety of other universities as well. And I was more or less in charge of the project. Um, and so just to give you an idea what we did is we, we had people go out and cut um, trees at differing levels. Um, these are levels that are reasonable for, for uh, economically viable uh, timber harvests in the Appalachians. And so we did one which we call the heavy harvest. You can see a lot of the trees were removed in this harvest. Uh, we had intermediate harvest, which a little bit less uh, removal of, of, of canopy. We had a light harvest, which was a little bit less. And then we had our controls. And we collected data both before or pre-harvest and post-harvest. And uh, the data included all sorts of things from surveys for densities of cerulean warblers, plus a whole bunch of other species, um, we searched for nests and, and, and then studied how um, cerulean warblers uh, nest success changed before and after harvest and in comparison with controls. Uh, we caught birds and looked at their, their condition and their age structure across these different types of harvests. And then we, or I mostly analyzed all this. Um, and so just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we got to see, it was, it was amazing four years. Um, Here's an idea, you, you probably imagine, can imagine that it's really where there's nests are, are pretty hard to find. Um, turns out I had a secret weapon in my wife who is the greatest cerulean warbler nest searcher in the history of cerulean warbler nest searching. She, if there was a Guinness Book of World Records for that, she would definitely have it. And so here's an idea of one of the nests. Um, this is through a scope looking at a nest. It's in that red uh, circle. And, we, and now this one's an exception because this nest is actually about 45 feet off the ground but you could watch it from a cliff ledge. And so we got some amazing video of this nest, the, the most documented cerulean warbler nest in the history of the world also. Oops, I'll go back. So here's what we got to watch. There's a female that's, that's actually in the process of building the nest. You may be able to hear cerulean warblers singing in the background here. And so we, 
got to get really close up and intimate with the lives of these birds. And, and oh man, what a, an amazing experience it was. And so here again, watching this, this female putting this, this delicate little nest up, uh, again, probably about 45 feet up in a, in a basswood in this case, but we just had the lucky opportunity to be able to watch it from this, this location. And we continue to watch these guys throughout their, their nesting cycle. Here's, here's now a female incubating. Um, same nest, it's a little bit uh, zoomed in a little more through a, through a, a spotting scope. And you know, we, got to, we named these birds, we, we got to know them really well, especially the, we named, especially named the ones that we banded. Females, not too, not too often, but the males, we banded a large majority of them. And so we got to watch them uh, throughout the cycle. And eventually we got to see things like this. And so here are, here are four little uh, uh, nestling cerulean warblers jam packed into their nest. Um, and we'd watch them all the way to the end till they uh, either fledged, uh, which we were always rooting for, or we knew what was gonna happen sometimes. They were either eaten by predators or most of the time, very rarely did they die of starvation, uh, but eventually, but a, a few times they did. Uh, most of the time they would just disappear and we likely the culprit were, was some sort of predator. Sometimes we had information on the predator, but oftentimes we did not. And so I'll just show you a little bit of the data and, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, but um, this is um, all looking at the difference from pre-harvest to post-harvest. And this is first looking at the density growth rate of, of the birds on these different harvests. And this is across um, 10 sites throughout the Appalachians. And I'll just point out, first of all, that cerulean warblers uh, loved harvests, especially our intermediate harvests, where we removed about 50% of the, the canopy. And you can see the numbers just exploded. And this means they went up by about 10 times uh, in these sites. And in some places, they went up by almost three years post-harvest, they went up by about 30 times. And so incredible growth rate that we saw. And, and, it, and just to point out down here is the control, this, this dark line. And so the control did what you hope controls are gonna do. They stayed at about one, which means they stayed at about um, the same level of density uh, of birds throughout the study. And so we immediately saw this, res this results, which is pretty amazing. And then to me, somewhat unexpected, as someone that kind of grew up thinking cutting trees was, you know, is always bad. If you're if you're an environmentalist and you uh, cut trees, that's that's typically not thought of as a positive thing. But in this case, for the most part, it was. Now I will say there was a, a second part of this, and that was the reproductive response. And this is something you have to to balance um, with those previous results. And that, and that what we see here is that the intermediate, again, that one that that went way up, um, had decent nest success. And this is across the three post harvest years. Um, and so nest success was about 55 to 60%, which is pretty good still. Um, but if you compare that to controls, which were the unharvested areas, not quite as good. We had amazing nest success in the controls. So, you know, it looks like there may be some cost to pay, even though you increase the density of birds in those areas, you may have more of them getting depredated, which is not unexpected given the fact that they are more out in the open. Um, and the other thing I wanna point out during this research is one of the really cool um, pieces of data that, that came out of it were these nest tree selection. And so what this means is um, how often did the birds choose the trees to nest in? Um, and we also looked at territories and nest patches versus how available those trees were. And I just wanna point out a few things. Um, right here, the P stands for preferred and the A stands for avoided. So statistically showing that they actually preferred that species of tree. And so the two species of tree that, that came out for the nest trees to be prefer preferred were sugar maples and white oaks. And so you see those peas in this kind of light colored bar right here. Those were preferred versus the random available trees that they could have chosen from. And the thing that makes it really interesting is that when you look at which trees were avoided as nest trees, those were the red maple and the red oak. And so you had sugar maples preferred, red maples avoided, white oaks preferred, red oaks avoided. We still don't know exactly why, but we have speculated this has potentially something to do with, with the tannin component of, of the leaves, which make them less palatable to the insects that cerulean warblers would be feeding to their nestlings. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows that white oaks and, and sugar maples are more palatable by caterpillars, which are by far the most uh, um, prevalent and common food item that these birds feed to their to their nestlings. There's other possibilities as well having to do with, 
with a uh, structure allowing for them to, to attach their nest to. Uh, white oak have kind of this flaky bark that allows them to, to kind of wrap their, uh, as do sugar maples as they get older, uh, wrap their wrap spider webs to attach their nest. Whereas red oaks and red maples, maybe red oaks not as much, but red maples, um, smoother bark that may make it a little more difficult to attach. But really interesting results there and, and really meaningful. And in the end, you know, we published a whole bunch of papers, but the one that I'm probably most, and, and uh, some of this was highlighted in our Cerulean, that Cerulean Blues book that, that uh, Steve pointed out. But this is the one that I'm probably most proud of. And this is actually a, a very short document that came from all of our research, but was aimed at landowners, um, state and federal agencies, and uh, even timber companies for how they can use our data to, to best manage these, uh, these tracts of forest in the Appalachians. And we came up with really specific uh, management recommendations, which I'm not gonna go over completely um, because they're, they're somewhat, uh, um, you know, you, unless you guys are, are, are gonna go out and manage for some cerulean worlders on your land in the Appalachians, probably not all that uh, interesting. But the point is we took our basic science, we took our interesting basic science and then turned it into to actionable recommendations, which, which I am a really big fan of. Um, and you know, while I was a fan of that, I was also doing more of this uh, kind of more basic, um, I guess, more esoteric research. One of them looking at the color patterns that these birds had and trying to understand um, if there's a, some meaning, some information that is passed on from the, the, the males, which are these striking blue color to the females. Now we might look at a really warbler and think, well, they all kind of look the same, but as you might guess, they really don't, especially if you look really closely at them. They differ in the amount of blue and green that's in their back and on the crown. They differ in the, the, the width and the size of their breast band, uh, how black that breast band is. They differ in the amount of white in their tail. And so I took a lot of really detailed um, uh, measurements of these birds. And I'm just gonna point out one of them that, that was one of the more interesting ones. And this is looking at um, the, the, how blue their rump was. And so the birds vary in how blue their rump was, uh, is, and, and it's pretty correlated with their crown and their back as well. But the rump feathers are a little easier to collect. Um, and I use pretty high tech equipment to get actual amounts of, or the actual wavelengths that, that bounce back when you shine pure light at these birds. And that wavelength is reflected in the, the scale here on the Y axis. Uh, the numbers down here are more blue. The numbers up here are more green. Uh, and this SY and ASY refers to second year birds, which are young birds, first breeding season. After second year birds are older birds that, ha that have had at least one year potentially of breeding. And what we found out, even when counting, accounting for age, uh, birds that are bluer, males that are bluer, feed their nestlings at higher rates than birds that are greener. And so if you're a female making a decision about who you wanna mate with, it behooves you to, to choose the, the, those individuals that are a little bluer than other individuals. And so this is a really quick, rather than having to watch the birds and count how many, how many caterpillars they, they catch in an hour, females can use this information to make a, a, a somewhat informed decision about, about who they're going to mate with. All right, so I finished my uh, PhD at University of Tennessee. Um, and then I came back to Illinois and I actually uh, went back to University of Illinois uh, and got my postdoc or did my postdoc at, uh, at University of Illinois. But I actually didn't do the research in Illinois. I actually went down to, to Central Texas to do that research. And that research was uh, on two really amazing species as well. One that some of you may have never seen, and that's a black cap vireo, um, which is one of our endangered bird species or on the process, it's in the process of not being endangered anymore. Uh, but then another species that is, is the uh, uh, antagonist for a lot of our stories about birds uh, and maybe even bird declines. And that's the brown-headed cowbird. But I still think brown-headed cowbirds are amazing species. Um, and here you can see in a nest, this is, this is a giant brown-headed nestling. And here is a, a tiny little black cap vireo nestling. By the way, black cap vireos are our smallest warbler, or our smallest vireo. And they're also the only vireo that is dimorphic um, with the, the males having a much blacker head and the females having a much uh, grayer head. And so I was studying how black cat vireos respond to this brood, parasit brood parasitism, which they face, which they, it, it had kind of been, the, the story had been that 
brown-headed cowbirds were largely responsible for the decline of black cat vireos. And so they had spent a lot of time and money catching uh, brown-headed cowbirds, killing them, and hoping that that then helped black cat vireos rebound. And it probably did help a little bit, but there's a, there's a, a problem with that story to a certain extent in that um, brown-headed cowbirds and black cat vireos have been co-evolving together for a long time. They are not one of these eastern warbler, eastern wood warblers that um, brown-headed cowbirds just recently have been um, uh, exposed to uh, in the last, you know, 100 years or so, 150 years. And so we wanted to know, do black cat vireos actually have ways of avoiding brood parasitism? And so the first thing we looked at was something called, so I, I, I did a lot of nest searching, found lots of nests, and then looked to see if they had been parasitized and then saw what happened and collected a whole bunch of data on it. And the first thing we noticed is that one of the things that, that black cat vireos could do is they can nest across a very wide range of time frames. And when you overlay this with um, uh, the portion of nests parasitized, what we find is that the earlier they nest, the less likely it is that they're going to be parasitized. And that matches pretty closely up with what you'd expect, covered peak fertility. Black cat vireos uh, have an earlier um, ability to, to lay eggs than brown-headed cowbirds do. That's not to say that brown-headed cowbirds couldn't evolve in earlier time frame, but um, we also know that brown-headed cowbirds parasitize lots of other species as well. And so um, it's not very likely that they're going to evolve earlier time frame just to take advantage of a black cat vireo. Um, and so that's the first thing that we saw. The second thing we saw that black cat vireos can do is they can choose nests that are much less likely to be parasitized by, by cowbirds. And so what cow, female cowbirds do is they, they hang out very quietly and very stealthily and just watch. They just sit and watch. And if you've ever come across a female cowbird in the understory of a forest, for instance, it's very likely she's gonna be quiet and she's not gonna be doing anything except just sitting there. And what she's doing is she's watching the, for females to make a mistake more or less and lead her to their nest. And so you could have something like this where a female brown or a female black cat vireo flies into, this is in, in the case of a uh, black cat vireo, these are shinoak, uh, it's called shinnery where you have a whole bunch of these, these low lying weird sh low uh, oak called shinoak um, and they'll fly in there. And then sometimes they'll make a decision to then kind of come back to the edge and lay their nest on the edge. And what we found is those nests, as you might expect, were much easier to find by a, by a cowbird than this other option where you have a black, uh, black cat vireo female flies to the edge and instead of lay, uh, building her nest on the edge, she builds it in the middle of the shinnery. Um, and the reason why it's possible that brown-headed cowbirds are indirectly related to the decline of black cat vireos is because of how humans have changed these, this shinnery we have turned these into much smaller patches. We have um, opened up areas. And so you have these small patches where there's not a lot of interior and almost all you have is exterior. And so while the cupboards are the proximate cause of the decline possibly, the ultimate cause of the decline is the changing habitat that has um, left these birds at much more vulnerable risk of, of being parasitized. And there's a third thing that I documented that, that's never been docu documented before. It's, it's long been thought, or and it probably is true, that, that black cat vireos bills are too small to grab a cowbird egg and throw it out of the nest. And so, you know, even if they recognize that's not my egg, I want to get rid of it, there's nothing they can do. And there's a couple of reasons that could be possible. One of them could just be they have a constraint on their bill size. Their bill is made for capturing smaller prey and it's never been as big of an issue as it is recently to have to be able to remove an egg. But I found several nests, still don't know how it happened, where there was a cowbird egg in the nest one day, and the next day there was no longer a cowbird egg in the nest, and instead that cowbird egg was under the nest. Um, and so, you know, in other species, there's been documentation of birds kick ejecting, so they use their feet to remove the egg from the nest and push it out possibly use their, their shoulder or their wing to possibly put it up, push it out as well. We don't know. Uh, we know that that egg was no longer in there. It, I mean, it's also feasible that another cowbird removed the egg, uh, but in that case, typically you would expect that that new cowbird would have laid an egg in the nest instead. And that wasn't the case. We would just find a cowbird in the egg in the nest one day, 
and then out of it. We, we, we've always talked about going back and, and doing some um, camera work um, where we set up cameras to watch uh, what happens, but it has not happened so far. All right, so left, uh, left Texas. Oh, I got one last thing. So this is at a time when I, when I uh, now had a young son. And so this is the beginning of, of taking my son out to do some uh, field work with me. And here's uh, a video of him. This is a, this is a black cat vireo nest right here. You can hear a vireo that's very angry at us. And so the, the vireo uh, was very angry at us for looking at his nest. Uh, and uh, that was my, one of my son's first chances to go up, come out in the field with us in Texas. All right, so now I move on. Um, and this is now when I, I, I finally get to Arkansas. Um, so I'm in Arkansas State University now. And uh, I, I took a position as a, a professor at Arkansas State University. And so the rest of the research I'm gonna to talk to you about all happens um, here in Northeast Arkansas, uh, or at least while I'm working at Northeast Arkansas, but you'll see it's all over the, the country and, and in some ways all over the world. Um, the first place I went after that was to Western Pennsylvania. And I went back to studying cerulean warblers. Uh, one of the, uh, the black boxes of, of understanding the life cycle of, of a lot of passerines is the time right after they leave the nest. And so we, we think of the nest being a really dangerous time. And it is. And a lot of nests fail. And, and a lot of birds are unable to produce young, which obviously has negative effects on the population. But there's, there was some anecdotal evidence that, that there was a period that was actually even more dangerous than the time in the nest. And that period was right after they leave the nest. At least in the nest, they are in one spot um, that, that is relatively well chosen by the parent for being concealed uh, and providing uh, safety from predators. But once they leave the nest, they're kind of uh, on their own to a certain extent, at least as to where they're going to go for, for at least a period of time. And you can see this little puffball right here. Um, they are pretty much just little chicken nuggets that can't get away from a predator at that point either. And so what we did is we went to Western Pennsylvania. Um, we studied cerulean warblers uh, again across a area that, that involves a lot of forest management. So this is now the Northern Appalachians. Um, and we uh, would find nests, we'd follow the net, those nests, we'd cross our fingers that they would, that they would make it to uh, fledging. And then we'd go over and we would put radio um, transmitters on these young nestlings, tiny little transmitters that allowed us to follow them and see what they do after they leave the nest. Uh, and this is my first grad student that worked on this project, uh, Doug Raybuck, who's now a PhD student at University of Tennessee. Uh, but he's, he, he did a lot of this work. And so you can see us climbing trees to get to some of those nestlings. And so this is what we did. Uh, here's a little nestling that, that we, we found and put a transmitter on. You can see over here, um, really cute um, little guy with this little tail right here. And we followed them through the, the woods with, with antenna. Um, and eventually what we did is we made this, this, this figure right here, which comes from one of our publications, that shows how these birds move across the landscape as they grow up. Um, and so we'll start out down here. Here's their nest. And then these pictures right here kind of indicate what the forest looks like. Um, most of their nests are in those forests that have some management occurring. So you can see the number of big trees are, are relatively small, a lot of saplings. So these are a lot of forests that were probably about five or six years after harvest, um, at least a, a, what we call a shelterwood harvest. And the birds didn't move much for the first couple of days. They moved about 30 meters from the nest. Then three to six days after, after they have left the nest, they started to move into a different habitat. They started to move into a habitat that was much more contiguous, less um, clear openings in the canopy. At this point, the birds were much more mobile, so they actually could move. And so you know, part of this at the, at the young age is simply, they just don't have the ability to move very well. And so they are kind of at the mercy of where the nest was. And once they had the ability to move, they moved up into the canopy, and they stayed up in the trees and they found places that were relatively safe from predators. By the way, pretty much all the birds that died from predators, um, once we put those radio transmitters, happened in these first two days. It turns out that those first two days are more dangerous than the time in the nest. And, and that's a very interesting, another story that I can talk about another time, but um, they leave the nest, even though they are safer in the nest than, um, than if they had uh, 
or so they, so you'd think they would have wanted to stay there. But from a parent's perspective, the parents want them out because the parents need to, to move on also. But, but anyhow, three to six days after, after fledging, they, they move about 100 meters from the nest. Seven to 12 days, they move about 180 meters. Um, and then uh, at about 13 meters, they make huge jumps away from the nest. So 13 days after they leave the nest, they go to about almost a half a kilometer away from the nest. And then eventually they are almost fully mobile. Um, they're between 21 to 36 days, they're moving um, over a kilometer from the nest. We had some that moved five kilometers that we luckily found um, in these hills and forests that the signals don't always carry all that well. Uh, but they move back to habitats that really look a lot like what they were born in as well. And so it's really neat how they use a whole variety of mosaic of forest types as they grow uh, from a tiny little baby to a little bit bigger to relatively full grown. I will say they were still with their parents this whole entire time. And so they were foraging on their own at this point, but uh, they still followed their parents around or they stayed together in some fashion at, at even 36 days. And that's when the batteries on those transmitters die. All right, next then, we moved on, uh, back down to the, the Delta into Memphis. And this was a really cool project that um, I had a grad student that, or an undergrad that came to me and said, hey, I really wanna study scissor tail flycatchers. Um, I don't think of, of the Delta as a place where scissor tail flycatchers live. I think of them as a great plains bird. And I definitely don't think of Western kingbirds living there. But it just turns out that um, both these species um, have been expanding their ranges eastward over the past 30 years, 20 years especially. And so we uh, had heard these stories from birders in the area. It was completely anecdotal and it was completely driven by bird watchers saying, hey, we think there's hybridization going on. We've seen these two different things go into these nests. They nest almost exclusively on, on utility poles. Um, Someone should study this. Uh, and so Alex, I, I brought this up to Alex and I was like, hey, you wanna study this? I had no idea how easy it would be, how difficult. Turns out it's really difficult, but um, Alex was an amazing uh, um, researcher, uh, especially a field biologist. And he went into the most dangerous of, of field uh, sites. In this case, this is the Memphis impound lot, the police impound lot in Memphis that is just full of a bunch of burned out cars. Turns out these guys uh, love, um, urban industrial areas um, for one reason or another, at least in this part of their range. And actually Western Kingbirds are famous for um, electrical substation hopping across the, the, the central US. Um, they are almost exclusively found in urban areas now. Scissor tails in the Eastern part of their range are also really urban birds. But anyhow, these guys, turns out that people thought they were hybridizing. And so we wanted to find out for sure. And so we went out and found lots of nests. Here's your typical habitat for a, uh, a scissor tail flycatcher, Western kingbird. And so here you see the scissor tail flycatcher come into the nest, feeding some nestlings. Um, and you'll see in a second, uh, this was the male at this nest, I believe. And so there's your scissor tail flycatcher. And soon enough, we'll get the, the female to show up, I hope. There you go. Yeah, there's a the, there's so there's the female now. This is a western kingbird. And you know, you might ask, well, how do you know for sure that these nestlings are really a, a product of these two birds versus a, another western kingbird that was nearby? They they do something called extra pair copulation, where she might mate with a, a a pure western kingbird, and then this guy thinks she might not mate with him also, and he thinks he's the dad, but we don't know for sure. Um, and so we actually also captured these nestlings. We took blood from the parents, we took blood from the nestlings, and we did genetic work. And we also expanded beyond just this area of, of, of eastern, northeastern Tennessee and, and Memphis. And we collected museum samples from across the ranges of both the western kingbird and then the scissor tail flycatcher. And so here's some locations where we got uh, samples. And then I'm not going to go into this a lot, but I'll try to explain this really quick, quickly. This is a, a, a figure that's called, a, um, comes from a program called Program Structure. And what it shows is the amount of genetic material that was associated with individuals. Each one of these columns is an individual bird. The light blue represent the scissor tail flycatchers. The dark blue represent Western kingbirds. 
And so birds that are really 100% Western Kingbird should be mostly, almost 100% of this dark blue. Birds that are 100% scissor tail flycatcher should be mostly this light blue. Um, and what you see here is that even, so these are the birds in the core, even in the core, there are a few birds that look like they carry scissor tail flycatcher genes. But if you looked at the, the specimen and the museums that hold them, called them Western Kingbirds. Uh, these right here are birds from, from Memphis and from Eastern, Northeastern Arkansas. And you can see lots of what's known as integration, clear hybridization occurring between these species. Um, here, are, here's another one. This, this bird was a hybrid actually that made it with this pure uh, scissor-tailed flycatcher. And so we documented this, this phenomenon. It, I'm not gonna show you this data, but the other thing that's interesting is these birds, even the hybrid uh, mating pairs did really well. We didn't have a bunch of you know, misshapen um, genetic mutants that were, that were dying in the nest. Most of them fledged, or at least, actually our hybrids did better in terms of their nest success than the pure birds that we, that we caught and watched their nest as well, which is really surprising. Um, and so it turns out that these guys can hybridize pretty easily and they do pretty well. Now, what's keeping them from hybridizing much more in the core? We don't really know that exactly. Um, and we are continuing our, our research on this in, in that regard. And this is now my daughter's first chance to really come in the field. And so here's one of our, uh, some of my grad students, my wife, uh, and here's my daughter, Cora. Um, her first bird, one of her first birds she had to pet was this little baby hybrid uh, scissor-tailed Western uh, kingbird, um, and here she is coming over to pet it. So we're collecting blood and then let it go. All right, next study, here we go. We're moving on fast and furious. Um, here we go now to, uh, back to Eastern Tennessee, where uh, we looked at um, a phenomenon that was occurring there with um, an invasive uh, adelgid. And so this is a Eastern hemlock, which is a really foundational species, especially along the streams of the Southern Appalachians. Uh, this, this work was done by my, by my grad student, Lee Bryant, or a lot of it was. Um, and so these little white blobs on here are, um, are adelgids and they pretty much kill hemlock. And so here you can see a, a hemlock that's falling down across this tree and they're completely changing the, the environment in the, in the Southern Appalachians. In some areas, all the hemlock are dead. And I'm just gonna show a really brief little bit of study. And so we want a little bit of this study. We wanted to find out what impact this was having on birds. Um, and what's happening is these forests, sorry, hold on a second, I'm not sure why. Uh, these forests uh, are changing from this evergreen hemlock dominant understory to, to rhododendron mostly. Um, and what we found out is that these birds aren't necessarily disappearing, but from the nest survival perspective, they are actually suffering at least a little bit where the birds that are in areas where you have a lot of young hemlock are doing much better than the areas where you have a lot of rhododendron. Uh, and one of the reasons we think this is so, it has to do with predation. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna fast forward this a little bit, but this, this video, hopefully this comes up. This is a video that we took um, with a, a Louisiana water thrush, uh, a male that, it's the running water that is protecting this nest against a snake. And so I'm gonna just fast forward a little bit to show you the bird. So here's the snake, first of all. You can kind of see it's a young black rat snake that's coming up right here. The nest is tucked in right here. And I'll show you the, the bird that comes up. So we had this, we had cameras on the nest to, to watch what happened. So the, the, here comes the male. So you can see the bands on his legs. We banded this bird. He came over and starts pecking, pecking at that snake, attacking it. And he actually threw it out of the way, even though it was hard to see. I'll slow it down here for you. You can watch what happens here. So here comes the bird, gonna dive in there and you'll see this pecks once. He's back. He's making himself look big. Now he's gonna go back and here it is. I think this is the one. Yeah, not yet, maybe a little more. One more try. Snake's still in there. This time, there we go. And there goes the snake, just tosses it out of it. And it was a pretty small snake, and obviously it was a full-grown black rat snake. That bird would not have been able to do that. But even that little snake could have eaten those nestlings. So a pretty cool um, response 
And we think a lot of this, 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 these results are, are in effect related to changing predation pressures uh, under those different uh, habitat types. All right, so next, um, going back to, to Arkansas and to Wisconsin now, um, and actually there's a ton of research that, that we did um, involving prothonotary warblers. I'm not gonna go over all of it, but here are a bunch of the collaborators from all over the Eastern US and even into Colombia. This is our collaborator from Selva from, from Colombia. Uh, we've studied habitat selection, migration, genetics, uh, Bergman's rule. I'm just gonna talk about two of these research um, um, topics. And this, this is known as the prothonotary warbler working group. It's just a bunch of uh, people that are interested in studying and conserving prothonotary warblers. And so we'll start with, with migration. So in this case, we um, put little backpacks on these birds. We caught them on their breeding grounds. You can see on this map here, here are the locations where we caught them. Uh, put little backpacks on them that, that collected light, which when we recapture the birds, we can take those backpacks off and then download data that has to do with sunset and sunrise. And then we can interpolate where on earth that sunrise and sunset occurred at that day, at that time, and figure out where they went. And this map here uh, kind of summarizes what we found um, from all these locations. Really interestingly, prothonotary warblers, no matter where they breed, are all really packed in, in Colombia especially, and into Panama. Um, they're either along the coastlines with mangroves or along the Magdalena River uh, Valley, which is a really unstudied area in Colombia. And so they have a really highly concentrated um, wintering grounds, much more so than their breeding grounds. Uh, which is was never known before. And you know, from a conservation perspective, I'm not sure where that went on. From a conservation perspective, um, that's kind of good news in the fact that you can get a lot of bang for your buck. If you want to protect prothonotary warblers from Wisconsin, you can go to Panama and go to Columbia. If you want to protect prothonotary warblers from South Carolina, you go to the same exact areas. And so you can get a whole bunch of conservation bang for your buck by focusing in these areas in, um, in South America. And you know, the Magdalena River Valley is a, is a kind of a sad story of, of what happened, has happened to Columbia um, post um, FARC and post uh, Civil War, more or less. So Colombia is one of the safer places now to go in, in much of South America. Venezuela has flipped with it. Um, but what that's done is opened up all sorts of economic opportunities. And so there's all sorts of talk about damming the Magdalena in multiple spots, um, developing areas that hadn't been developed for a long time, largely because of the internal strife. So, you know, it's like, uh, you don't want civil war, but you also don't want the, the what happens when countries move away from that. Uh, by the way, this bird right here is named Sugar. Um, if you, anyone wants to go back to look for him, he is found at the Nelson River boat ramp. I went back last June. Um, he's at least six years old now. That bird carried a backpack down to Columbia and back, and he's gone back and forth another three times since then. Um, and he's been in the exact same spot right at the boat ramp. Um, if anyone's ever been to Avon Bottoms uh, near uh, just north of, of Rockton, um, Illinois, so just across the border in, in Wisconsin. All right, next thing I wanna talk about with prothonotaries uh, is more academic research, but it's pretty cool in relation to climate change, especially. So a lot of these birds we study, we, we study them out of these nest boxes that we put up, which gives us access to their whole life cycle from eggs to tiny little nestlings, to babies, to, to, to adults. And so Bergman's rule is a rule that, that states that as birds, um, as you go farther north, birds get larger and larger and larger, even within the same species. And so we wanted to see if that was the case with prothonotary warblers, which is a, a migratory bird, which you don't typically think of this happening with migratory birds as much because the idea is the birds are larger farther north to make up for the fact that it's colder in the winter and they can maintain their body temperature uh, much more easily. But these guys live leave in the winter, so it doesn't necessarily make as much sense. But we wanted to see if maybe the nestlings would be the reason why, because these guys as young, as young nestlings are really at the mercy of the environment. And so we studied these birds across latitudes uh, and we found that as expected, these birds got larger, even as little nestlings, as you went farther north. As they got older, that same pattern existed. As adults, the same pattern existed. Uh, both males and females got larger as you went from farther south to farther north. And then we also looked at eggs. So eggs have to maintain, need to be maintained at, at certain temperatures as well. So we wanted to see if, uh, if this was the case. And so first we looked at historical records of eggs from museum specimens. These are from 1860 to about 1920. Uh, we don't collect eggs much anymore. Uh, this was an old, uh, 
uh, strategy of scientists and, and uh, curators um, that doesn't happen too much anymore. And we saw a little bit of a pattern where the farther south, the smaller, and the farther north, a little bit larger. But interestingly, we've actually, we've actually uh, documented the reversal of this pattern in our contemporary examples that were collected between 19, or 2018 and 2019. And we still don't understand it exactly. And it's, it's, this, the especially, especially weird part of it is that um, we now see that uh, we saw that the nestlings were larger in the north. And so somehow these birds are making larger nestlings from smaller eggs. And so we're gonna continue to study this a little bit by looking at the egg composition um, to see if birds in the north are making up for the fact that their eggs are smaller. They lay, lay larger clutches, they can incubate more of them, and they make up for the fact they're smaller by putting more testosterone and other hormones into those eggs and increasing their yolk content versus the eggs in the south. That, that's what our hypothesis would be. All right, moving on. Um, this next part of the study is going to cover a whole bunch of areas across the eastern U.S. and even in, back into Idaho into western U.S and right in the Chicagoland area. And so some of these birds that we studied for this part uh, came from, uh, from Blackwell Forest Preserve. And this is taking a whole different angle now. We're now looking at um, feather mites and warblers. These are things that live on warblers that most people know nothing about. But if you look really closely at bird feather wings um, and closely at their feathers, you'll see these little things that are tucked in um, the, the feathers, sometimes you can, you can see a whole bunch of things. They look like dirt if you don't look really closely. Um, this is a close up of a picture. And this is what they look like if you get really close up. This is 194 times uh, magnification. Uh, and this is, this, a lot of this work was done by my grad student who was my master's student and is now a PhD student. And her name is Alex Matthews and she's just done a phenomenal job. And so the first thing we wanted to do is to look at what species of feather mites live on what warblers. And we wanted to see if there is what's known as co-speciation occurring between the birds and the warblers. So we, we use this group of warblers to start out, 13 species plus something that used to be a warbler, but now is in its own family, and it's the all-breasted chat, um, in the very unfortunately named Icteriidae, not Icteridae. So just make sure if, you, if you're interested in bird taxonomy, it can be very confusing. I'm not sure why they had to give it such a close name to the blackbirds. But they do fall between uh, warblers and blackbirds, actually. And so we collected mites from all these birds, and then we collected, we, we sequenced their genetic data, and we put together this, what's called a co-phylogeny. Here are all the warblers we use with their scientific names, and here are the mites that we found on them. And what we found is really interesting. We found that in some cases, you have these really unique species, like this one right here. Here's a prothonotary warbler. They have a unique species, at least with this 13 uh, warbler subset. Uh, Northern water thrush, they have their own species. Now, interestingly, these feather mites are so unknown that most of them don't have names yet. They haven't been described. About 20% of feather mites have been described so far. And so we went on to a next step. Well, before I show you, I'll show you what these mites look like through a, a scope. So these mites do move. And so this is looking through a, a dissecting scope. Um, where you see two together, those are males and females that are attached. Um, and they move a lot more than you would have ever expected, that I ever expected especially once you've taken the feather off the bird. And so they are running for their life, more or less. Um, I'm just gonna show you really quickly a couple other um, figures that came from this work. Um, again, here's the prothonotary warbler that has their own species. Here, this is really new, this is a prairie warbler. They have actually two different species um, within the same genus of mite. Uh, this is a cool one. This is a uh, oven bird and a Kentucky warbler that share a mite, even though they're not that closely related, they actually share a mite. Uh, and then you have things like this, where you have six species that share a mite. Even this, so this mite is, is found on a whole bunch of different hosts. It's what we call host generalist. And so lots of really interesting things. And, I, and I'll finish with this, just talking about these new species that we identified. I, you know, going into to ornithology, you don't really think you're ever going to describe a new species, but it turns out if you study the things that live on birds, you still can. Uh, describe new species. And so we actually described four new species um, that at first were just called species two, species one, species three. They now all have names. Um, and I'll just point out one of them. This is Amarodectus jonesborensis. Um, and Jones, Jonesboro is where Arkansas State is. And, and most of our samples of this northern water thrush, even though northern water thrush don't breed in, in, in Jonesboro, they do pass through during migration. And all the samples we collected of this one were caught on our campus at our, we have a banding station on campus. And they were all captured there. Um, and so we went through the process of describing these mites. 
um, which includes drawing pictures like this. We didn't draw these, but our, our uh, Brazilian collaborators drew these. Um, the, all, the, all the feather mite taxonomists in the world do not live in the United States. There's a couple in Russia, a couple in Spain, and then one in Brazil. And, and Fabio in Brazil is, is a, now a, a big collaborator of ours. But it was an awesome process. We did the genetic work, we collected them, and he drew these pictures and it helped us uh, identify them as new species. A lot of the, the way you identify them as new species, besides the genetic information, has to do with their, their genitalia. So this is, this is more or less a, a mite penis. Um, and then uh, these hairs, these are called setae that come out in different locations. So it's a very, uh, it actually took, took about a year to describe those four species. All right, getting to the end here. Um, next one, uh, log red strikes. Uh, and so well, this, this work, a lot of this comes from my grad student, M. Donahue. Um, and we started, started studying these shrikes in agricultural areas during the non-breeding season. We know very little about shrikes in agricultural areas, and we know almost nothing about them during the non-breeding season. Um, and so we went out and started studying them in areas that look like this. Um, this is more or less what our study sites look like. A lot of agriculture, some ditches, some fence rows, um, hedgerows, and then dirt roads, miles and miles of dirt roads. Um, and so what we did is we started just going out and just watching birds. A lot of this is just like general natural history. And so one of the things that we did is we watched individuals. We would catch birds, we would ban them, and so we knew we were looking at the same individual. Uh, with color bands, as you can see here, I'll go back and you can see. So we know this bird and we gave them names and then we watched them. Um, and just to show you about how these birds use these habitats, they love wires. So they use these wires a lot. And it's not just because the wires are easy for us to see them on, they really do love wires. And I'll just show you how they use these, this habitat. Um, we'll start out with uh, right-of-way grasses. And so these right-of-way grasses, which are mowed sometimes, sometimes left alone, um, they love foraging in those areas. Oops, excuse me. They have pretty high success rate. And so this is the number of foraging attempts per hour um, and then their success rate. Ag fields, they use them a little bit, a little lower success and a little lower for and a little lower attempts. Ditches, they do go into the ditches sometimes and catch frogs. They have pretty high success, but they don't forage in there all that often. And then the roads, they don't forage on too often, which is probably a good thing, uh, but they have really high success, which again makes sense because the prey items are really obvious when, they, when it's you know, a cricket crossing the road. And even then during the non-breeding season, these birds really focused on invertebrates. Oh, they also do some aerial fly catching as well, which is somewhat of a surprise. And so we also searched for these birds, uh, uh, larders as they're called, or, or caches, and we found tons of, of items. Um, we identified 122 different prey items, um, even spiders, hemipterans, grasshoppers, crickets, uh, vertebrates. We found lots of different frogs skinks, small mammals, um, snakes. This one right here was a garter snake that was as big as, um, it was probably two and a half feet long and a little loggerhead shrike caught it. So we got to find all of these uh, caches. The interesting thing that we found out is that if you go out and try to study a loggerhead shrike diet just based on these caches, these larders, you're gonna think that all they do is eat mostly or, or mostly they eat vertebrates. When, when you watch the birds though, you realize are mostly eating invertebrates and they're only caching some of the larger vertebrates. And so invertebrates remain really important to them even in the colder winter months. Uh, we even saw them catching uh, robins uh, or at least eating robins, uh, earthworms, crayfish. And so uh, it'd be these, these uh, locust trees were just sometimes loaded with, with various prey items. It's pr it was pretty fun to search for these things. We also studied how often they come back to the same location. So we've now been studying these birds for years. And what we find out is that females actually, or males actually come back at a, at a much closer distance. And so in, in average, they come back about a little over a thousand meters. So one kilometer or so. Females come back at a much farther distance. Um, in total, about 1500 kilometers. We did see some really um, long movements. And so here's one that moved about eight kilometers from one winter to the next. Here's one that moved about nine kilometers from one winter to the next. So there are some exceptions. If you throw out those exceptions, a lot of them are really site faithful. They come back to the same exact location. We also looked at home ranges. And so we're learning about how much space these birds use. Even in these ag areas, they don't really use that much space. They, uh, this is one of the larger ones, about 14 hectares, um, which isn't all that big. We, we would have thought they were using more area. So they are making their, their living in a relatively small area. In general, uh, about 50% of them are less than five hectares. Which 
that's only about uh, you know, 12 and a half acres or so. So it's a relatively small area that they are sticking in, which, which is really interesting and kind of unexpected. And then we looked at what's known as habitat selection. So how, what are they choosing when you compare what they have at their disposal? So what are they using versus what is available? And we looked at this at different scales. This is at about a half kilometer scale. This is all done using remotely sensed data, uh, GIS data. And it turns out that they actually like humans um, for the most part. So we're, we're not talking about urban like a city, but we're talking about farms. We're talking about power structures. We're talking about farm implements. And so we find them at a, at a large scale associated with homes, associated with usually these are, these are usually rural homes, but those homes have trees or shrubs, and that's where we're finding a lot of the strikes. At a much smaller scale, they like water. We're finding them using areas that have ditches, which probably makes sense. They eat lots of frogs. And then at an even finer scale, they like perches that are a little bit taller. These wires are, I would say with almost 100% certainty, if you got rid of wires in these areas, you would have very few shrikes. They are using these wires a ton. And those wires just so happen to be at about seven meters oftentimes, at least the lower wires. And that is where they're perching. That is where they're hunting from. Now, could you produce those same sorts of things um, with, with trees? Possibly, but they would have to be really scattered. Um, these wires are just ideal for shrikes in these areas. All right, last one, I think is the last one. And that's a project, these are all projects that are ongoing now. This, this has to do with cerulean warbler migration. And so we did the same sort of thing that we do with prothonotary warblers, but looking at cerulean warblers. Uh, and we went across um, their range and, and, and marked these birds and tagged them with those devices. And this, this map shows a very different story than the story that the prothonotary showed. The prothonotary showed all the birds really highly packed in one small area on the wintering grounds. We're learning that in cerulean warblers, they do something very different. They have what's known as pretty high migratory connectivity. What that means is the areas that they breed are really highly linked to the areas that they winter. So they're really highly connected. So the birds that are in the, the Ozarks, for instance, they're really highly connected with, the, with farther south in the Andes. These are, so these, in, the, in the winter, these birds are all above 5,000 feet in the Andes. And so for the most part, above 5,000 feet. And so these birds are going not to the Southern Andes, but to the central Andes, at least, into Peru, um, into Ecuador. The birds that are from the Appalachians and even into the, the upper Midwest, they are spending much more time in the northern Andes, in, in Colombia and into Venezuela. And so we see a very different picture. So for instance, if you want to conserve the Ozark birds, it wouldn't do you a lot of good to go to the northern Andes. It would do you a lot of good to work in central Andes, though, where those birds are going. Now, there is some overlap, so it's not 100%. But a much more uh, uh, isolated story than what we saw with with the um, prothonotary warblers. And actually, Jacob did not do this work, but he did do some others for the warbler that I didn't mention. So I wanted to at least give him a, a little shout out. All right, I'll finish up with just a few projects that we're working on coming up. We're we're starting to look at um, the effects of of some really. Um, disturbing pesticides, neonicotinoids, excuse me, I'm struggling to pronounce that. Neonics, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we call them neonics. Um, and so the, you may have heard of them before with their effects on bees and, and other invertebrates, but there's more and more information that they're affecting birds as well. And so we're starting some work this, this gr next growing season to look at how these things may be impacting shrikes. Um, we're also working on a project with local farmers to, to, to try to provide integrated pest management through the installation of, of, of nest boxes for, for kestrels, in this case, which are also declining a lot um, throughout much of their range. Uh, we're starting a project with um, Swainson's warblers, um, which are really cool birds as well, looking at their migratory patterns. And then, as I mentioned before, we're going to be looking at egg composition across the breeding range uh, for prothonotary warblers. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that um, have um, helped me along this path. Um, certainly my parents um, gave me a lot of support and helped me uh, all, all many, many times throughout my life. Uh, I really wanna thank Hal and the DuPage Birding Club for everything they did. Um, lots of advisors and mentors that, that have helped me a ton. I've had a ton of amazing students, especially grad students. I have not had one 
bottom of the barrel grad student yet. They've all been top notch collaborators, a ton of collaborators, lots of people that have helped fund this research. And then last but not least, my, my wife and kids um, who have also been incredibly supportive and have been along for a lot of this journey, to be honest. Uh, they come into the field with me a lot. Um, as I mentioned, Emily is, is an amazing nest searcher and she loves it. It's probably her, if she could do one thing for a career, I think it'd be nest searching. Um, and my kids are now expert bird handlers as well. Um, and so uh, it's, been a, it's been a great journey to, to share with them as well. And with that, I would be incredibly happy to take any questions or comments or criticisms that you guys might have. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Wow. Yeah, they got uh, nice banders holds on those birds there. That's pretty good. I like that. Your kids. Um, thanks, Don. That was wonderful. Um, I think everyone in the club will be happy to know there's a prothonotary working group, a warbler working group. So <laughs> that's uh, refreshing to hear something like that exists. Uh, we did have a question come in about really early in your um, your birding life. Did you see elegant trogons um, at the birding camp? Uh, was that Costa Rica? Yeah, we did see elegant trogons while we were there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we saw, I mean, it was like, it was like being on a Victor Emanuel tour, more or less. So they took us to, to all the spots. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. It was, you know, I, the, most of my memories of it are, are snapshots now, but I mean, I, there's a lot of snapshots there that, that um, I want to go back. And I actually, fingers crossed, have a ch chance to go back with some of our feather mite work. Uh, we need to collect um, war, uh, mites from, from red-faced warblers and Lucy's warblers and a, and a few other southeastern special specialties, uh, so we may be going back there next spring, hopefully. Yeah, I imagine feather mites and new species of them are everywhere. So it's just a matter yeah. of uh, you could be the one traveling the world finding them all. <laughs> so someone's got to do it, right? Yeah. Um, well, we do have a couple more questions that came in. Um, you have a lot of photos where you're holding birds. How was that accomplished? Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so you know, I, I skipped over most of the methods. To be honest, you know, the, the methods are are I think really interesting to people. Um, but for for this talk, I, um, I I skipped over a lot of those nitty gritty details. Uh, so we use typically. So there's two different ways that we catch birds. Well, three. Um, we use mist nets, uh, and so mist nets are are very fine um, nets. They look like fishing nets, but incredibly fine. They have the um, they make it look like mist, more or less, and the birds don't see them, and then the birds fly in. Now, how do we get them to go into the net? Almost all these birds are, the, um, are done through a process called target banding, where we play the song or um, an alarm call, possibly, of the species that we're, the individual that we're trying to catch. So we say, hey, there is a cerulean warbler. We want to catch that bird. We set up a net in the woods, we then put speakers typically on either side of the net. It's, you know, we, we've always, we've gotten a lot better than we used to be, but now we put speakers on either side of the net. We play a cerulean warbler song. That bird comes down to find out who the intruder is in its territory. And then when it comes down low enough where we have it at the level of the net, we then toggle the sound to the other side. It chases the imaginary bird, the, the intruder to the other side and gets caught in the net. Mm -hmm. um, we also then, now for, for shrikes, we do it something different. We use, we use little walk-in traps um, with a uh, lure mouse. And so we put a little mouse that's protected in a little cage inside of the trap. The shrike sees the mouse, comes down to try to catch the mouse. And when it does, a trap door closes behind it. And then we, then we get access to the, to the shrike. Um, there's a few other traps we can use with shrikes and, and um, and then there's a third way that we do it, with, which involves predators. So for the, the scissor tail flycatchers, they just don't respond. And the Western kingbirds, they don't respond to their to the uh, songs, if you want to even call them songs. They don't really have songs too much. Um, they just have twittering noises, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't really respond that heavily to those. But they do respond to predators that show up underneath their nest, especially when they have nestlings. And so we use crow decoys or um, hawk decoys. And then we play the sounds of those predators and the birds come to protect their young and then they get caught in the net. Okay. 
Um, go, we have a few more questions coming in. If you, if you have a little time, I'd love for you to be able oh, to. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I got all. Okay. Um, uh, Joe asks, what, what are the predators of cerulean nests and fledglings? What are the major predators you've found? Yeah, you know, we, we don't have a lot of information on that. Okay. Honestly, most of the time we'd be watching the net, we'd put, have our scope on the nest one day, there'd be, the, the, the birds would be incubating or feeding the nestlings. And most of the time we just come back the nest, next day and there'd be nothing there. And, you know, for all we know, um, so I, I shouldn't say for all we know, we're fairly certain that it's a predator. In, in general, birds wouldn't leave their nestlings even if they were sick. And you could usually tell that nestlings are sick by the way they're behaving, even from the ground looking through a scope. Um, so usually if the bird just abandons the, abandons the nest, it means that the birds are gone. It means that the nestlings have been eaten. So we do have some evidence of predators from, from cameras that we did put on the nest during the day. Blue jays, chipmunks. Chipmunks are huge uh, um, fledgling predators. Oh, well. wow. chipmunks, chipmunks will go 50 feet up into a tree, which I did not expect at all. Um, and so chipmunks, um, probably some squirrels, probably crows a little bit. I think we had a couple of crows. Um, Red-headed, red-bellied woodpeckers actually eat some. Uh, but if I had to guess, I would guess that most of the predation happens at night. And I think there's a couple culprits. I think raccoons and I think flying squirrels. If I had to bet, and, we, and we, you know, we've talked about putting up infrared cameras up in the canopy, that's a lot, a lot of work. Um, we have never done it. Um, I would bet those two would be the number one and two. Um, we had a lot of both of them at our, at our field sites. And at night, that's, you know, they're just wandering around, come across a nest and they'll eat whatever they can find. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like you got some good tree climbers at your lab. So maybe you'll get, get another student at some point to get up there and do that research. Um, uh, Vera wonders your favorite area of the country where you've researched. You I know um, <laughs> it's, it's a really hard question, but I have such amazing, I, and I spent every single day for three years out in the field in, in, in the Cumberland Mountains of, of East Tennessee. And so I'll never, I mean, I know, I've never been anywhere where I know the, the land so well that I could go back there in 10 years from now and remember more or less every hill. Um, I remember trees. I remember the places where nests were. Um, and so I would say the Cumberland Mountains of East Tennessee, um, which are these weird kind of offshoot of the Appalachians um, that are on their own. They're, 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 uh, they're kind of a, of a, a different um, geological history actually than the Appalachians, but they're the greatest place on earth for Cerulean warblers. And they're just amazing place. I got, we went back there this past year with my, my kids for, a, for another project. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, I, I don't think I'll ever have a place like that again. Yeah, it must be beautiful being able to, you know, go to between uh, Arkansas and Tennessee so readily, just the whole, that whole length, it sounds really fascinating. Um, it is. How do you decide what research to do next? Is it you? Is it the students? Do you have like 50 million ideas in your head already? Or? A very good question. And I, <laughs> I, you know, now I, I feel like now there's a little more um, reasoning behind it, um, logic, I'd say, and, and I'm building off of previous studies. But I, you know, I'm, I will say, I, I, I know a lot of people that study birds, um, but I'm not the, your average ornithologist anymore. Now a lot of people that study birds, study them because they are say, um, you know, a physiologist and birds are their, their study species. There's not a lot of people that are really ornithologists and then study everything about birds. So I'm kind of old school in that, mm -hmm. Any question involving birds, I'd be interested in asking. So I know a little bit about a lot of stuff, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not an evolutionary ecologist. I mean, if anything, I'd be a conservation biologist, but I do a lot of work that's outside of that also. And so, you know, a lot, it's just kind of organic. You know, if someone brings up a question and I think it sounds interesting, I'll do it. If we do some research that leads to another question, I'll do it. Certainly if we get funding from a grant no, yeah, that, fine. Yes. answer that question a little bit also um you know feather mites was just like i remember when i first started doing this really horrible work we kept seeing these little red things on the tails of the birds and no one knew what the what they were and no one could tell us anything about them and i finally found someone that's like oh yeah those are mites 
And I've been interested in them ever since. And so I decided, well, let's, let's study them. Okay. Um, I think I have one more question. I've also gotten some great messages from Jerry here saying he and, and Jerry and Jody have really enjoyed, you know, thought you were a special kid and are glad you turned out to be such a great ornithologist and everything. And I think I should be able to send you the text of those if you can't see them in the chat. Um, last one is Patagonia Lake. Have you ever been there? Patagonia Lake. That is. There's a guy who lives in Phoenix who's asking if you've been to Patagonia Lake. Oh, I do remember Patagonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you mentioned that, you know, so uh, years later, um, actually within the last four years, uh, I went through all my old um, bird records from, from Southeast Arizona, from, from that birding camp, and I entered them all into eBird. Um, and I remember, and I remember one of them being Patagonia. I didn't remember where that was exactly or what it was like, but I do remember Patagonia as a location that I then, I think I zoomed in on Google Earth and tried to make my best guess as to where it was um, for eBird purposes. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't upset the eBird, uh, the eBird uh, vetters too much. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't remember what it is or where it is, but okay. I know I was there. <laughs> I, I actually have a little story about Patagonia Lake. Oh, Dennis, okay. So uh, one, of our, one of our club members, Peter Casper, um, is the individual who found the least storm petrel on Patagonia Lake quite a few, quite a few years ago now. Um, that was quite a remarkable record. Uh, the, the bird was blown in from a storm and um, Peter was actually swimming in the lake and saw this bird bobbing like a little cork on the water, he decided to try and swim to it because he was in the water swimming around. <laughs> he, he thought it'd be cool. He thought maybe it was like a, a juvenile coot or something and from a distance. And so he swam up to it and he was hoping to get up close enough to it so he could grab it by his feet. And when he got close, he realized it was a, a tube nose and um, swam as fast as he could to shore, tried to find people. This is, this is way back before, you know, we had the internet and all the luxuries of birding today. So he, he, he called a local hotline and actually uh, Ken Kaufman and Will Russell and whoever was the person that uh, ran the hotline. The three of them came out the next morning and they split up in pairs and they went, they rented canoes and they canoed all over the lake trying to relocate this bird. So no one else got to see it except Peter, but the, the saving thing was that another Lee Storm Petrel showed up dead under a uh, street light in New Mexico. So it was blown in by the same storm. So here in the middle of the desert, you have a Lee Storm Petrel. Pretty oh, remarkable. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was actually disconnected for about five minutes. I lost connectivity here. Uh, so I That's hope I'm the not. Best part. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> kind of in the free question phase that uh, Don's willing to, to hang around with us. But obviously, people have things to do. They're welcome to, you know, I can say the meeting is kind of over if you'd like. <laughs> well, I actually do have two questions. Oh, okay. Go, please do. Yeah. So the, uh, the, they're, they're rather specific. So I don't know if anybody asked these while I was disconnected. Oh. Uh, but the one had to do with your your uh, black capped vireos work, and so the uh, the cowbird egg was was ejected from the nest. Did did you actually pick up the egg? Was it still intact? It was still intact. It was on the ground. Yeah, I picked it up and looked at it, and I then I put it I put it back. But yeah, it was still intact. Um, okay. I was just like curious. It, I was just curious if maybe you know that they had you know poked a hole in it or something and carried it out. No, back. yeah, that's yeah, so that's the other thing is um, they're they're in general vireos bills are not thought to be capable of of so another way of so some birds will puncture eject with a with a poke a hole and even though their bill is not big enough to fit around the whole egg if they poke a hole then they can use that little yeah opening to pick it up and throw it out and so there are birds that do that vireos have never done that we don't know if it's they have the hook bill which doesn't allow for stabbing as much um so yeah, you know, it's hard to know, you know, it, there, I saw other things out there that were weird that I, 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 in my head, I came up with these as adaptations possibly that vireos have evolved. And so one of them was we would see a cowbird lay an egg. And sometimes cowbirds would lay four eggs in their nest, but, but once in a while we'd have a, a nest where you have four vireo eggs and one cowbird egg. And that cowbird egg would be kind of in the middle. And then a day later, it would almost look like the cowbird egg had been pushed to the side and the vireo eggs were kind of in the heart of the of the cup, and then that cowbird egg wouldn't hatch. We had a number of, of nests where the vireos 
hatched, but the cowbirds didn't. And so my idea was like, well, maybe we're doing some sort of selective incubation. They're kind of just put, they're like, yeah, I can't get rid of this thing, but I can push it to the side and not warm it, not heat it the way that it has to be heated and everything will be fine. Well, it's interesting that, that maybe those black cap bureaus have found a, a fighting, a way to have a fighting chance. That's cool. Um, my second question had to do with the, um, the study where you were putting the transmitters on the uh, cerulean fledglings. So when you're putting them on, they're, they're in their um, juvenile plumage, but then they're going to molt before they migrate. So is that when they lose those transmitters? So yeah. So um while we are, we're unable to confirm this because our batteries died in three, after 35 days or so, um, the material that we use is, a, is an elastic material that in other studies have shown about two and a half months, it breaks down and falls off. Now we can't guarantee that it happened with our birds. Um, we saw very little evidence of, of the birds being impacted by those transmitters. Um, we're, we're always really concerned that something we do might impact the birds negatively. And so we take as much precaution as possible to, to um, make sure that that's not gonna happen. Now, the place that we put those birds, that we put those uh, backpacks um, allows for feather growth to more or less, it goes around their legs. So it's attached around their legs, actually. It sits on their back, mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. It's little harnesses around their legs and so the way that the bird's legs work is it tucked in there and so the way that the bird's body is designed is when you put that over their legs it kind of sits in the notch that their that their femurs produce and it doesn't slip off because of that little notch there and so there's not really any impediment for feather growth possibly there could be a little rubbing on the on the skin at the leg uh at the point where it's wrapped around there and so we don't glue them on. You can, there are, there are other transmitters that you can glue on. Ours were done with this elastic material that we hope, and we have evidence that supports it, would fall off before they migrate. And so that, that would be the hope. Because you don't want to, I mean, really, the, the bigger problem is not feather growth. The bigger problem is that extra weight during migration, especially for birds that are, that are going on their first migratory journey. And so right. Yeah, really That's do, where my point was going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Well, those were my two questions. And I, I did want to make sure that uh, I gave you a, a big thank you. I, I thought it was a great program. Yeah, that's so. spectacular. We do have two more that came in. Oh, Emily asks how many species of birds you've seen. <laughs> this, is a, this is a sad story. It must be an inside joke or something, but okay. <laughs> it's probably one of my kids that asked that, but from my son, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know for sure, um, unfortunately. And, and the reason I don't know for sure is because I, I had a journal that I took with me to both um, Colombia and Chile. And I left that journal on a plane. Mm. And I never transcribed it. I went back as soon as I possible and went through the book and tried to get as many of them down. And I've entered a lot of them into eBird since then also. This was before eBird um, or right at the beginning of eBird. But I'm probably you know a couple hundred birds off at this point. Um, worldwide, I think I'm at like I think my eBird says 1,200 or something like that. Um, but I think it's more like 1,400 would be my guess. Okay. I um, I think I have one more question, and then um, Vera wonders about the Idaho study with the barn owls. Um, has someone done a follow up on their mortality rates or anything like that? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I did before I left was um, we, I kind of set the stage for the next research. So they've done a couple of different things. One, the Idaho Department of Transportation um, did some experimental um, manipulation of, of roadway management. Um, and so they kind of had, this is how we do it and this is what we do. They tried to vary their management in a couple of different ways to see if in those hot spots we could reduce the number of owls that were killed. Um, and so that was one thing. And then the second thing that's happened since then is when I left, I put up a whole bunch of owl boxes at differing distances from the roadway. So one of the questions was, well, like, first of all, no one, I think over my entire time I collected, um, I forget how many owls, but it was more than anyone thought there were in the 
entirety of Idaho. No one knew there were that many barns <laughs> in Idaho. Like, I found that many dead. So the question was, where were these birds coming from? Were these birds kind of nomadic drifters? Were they breeding in the canyons? So it's along the Snake River Canyon. Um, where they, there's not a lot of barns, to be honest. Um, so we didn't really know. And so we put up these boxes at differing distances from the highway to try to get an idea of how far from the highway would these birds go to hunt along the highway? Was the highway such a prime hunting location that you could be drawing in birds from 20 miles away? And so we set up these boxes at differing distances. And the idea was to get owls to use those boxes, then put on transmitters to follow them and see if they would be going far away. And so both those studies have, have been ongoing. Um, we do know that the <laughs> uh, the, uh, the owls are coming from pretty far away to use the roadway, especially in the winter. And so in the winter, that roadway uh, is covered in grain because people there's, there's grain that's spilled by, by farm trucks, trucks that are hauling grain. There's, uh, they clear it of snow if there's any snow. And so it's the, probably the, the most, and, and it's warmer than the surrounding environment. So it, it's kind of a thermal refuge for, for, for rodents as well. And so um, the birds are coming from far away. Uh, the, the manipulation of the roadway has seems like it's been successful. And so I don't remember exactly how they changed their management, but it seems like it has reduced the number of roadkill. Um, they have not had another outbreak of, of dead barn owls like I found. There hasn't also been someone going out every single week to collect them. So as far as I know, it's been relatively successful what has been done so far. Um, and just the public um, um, knowledge that they have, especially from trucks, that they should look out for owls, um, which is hard to do when you're driving at night, especially. But, but I, I hope that some of the publicity that went along with that research has made people a little more aware and maybe a little more wary of, of the potential of hitting those birds. Yeah, I mean, you've really done a lot of research and I think the world has learned a lot, uh, you know, through you about, you know, how birds are using, you know, human made things as well as, and then you're giving advice about cerulean warbler habitat management and the owls and things. That's a, it's an amazing thing. And I have to ask one more question before I thank you again, but um, two people are asking about climate change. And I assume that's another thing that either is or will be informing a lot of your future research. Have you um, seen effects of it or, you know, birds affected so, by it? Um, just, yeah, so I know you uh, can't, you know, that's a big topic to, to, to answer, but. <laughs> no, 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 it's a good question. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying, I, I haven't done any really direct research on, on climate change. I've done a little bit indirectly through some of our work and I didn't get into this research actually. Um, um, so you, someone might have, wondered, you know, well, what do those feather mites do to birds? Are they helping them, hurting them? Are they just hanging out there and they have no effect? And so we've done a lot of research into that also. And, you know, one of the uh, concerns was that feather mites um, could impact birds um, under certain conditions, but not other under other conditions. And so one of the things that we've looked at is we've gone across latitudes and, and and studied how feather mites have affected birds. So we haven't technically looked at climate change, but we more or less, within the same species, for instance, yellow warblers, um, we studied them from their, their southernmost part of their range to much farther north in, in Idaho and, and Wisconsin. Um, Prothonotary warblers, common yellowthroats, we've gone from Louisiana all the way up to Wisconsin uh, to see how, this is ongoing work, so I, don't, I can't give you an answer yet, to see if, if climate or some weather variables could influence how feather mites impact birds. And there's a number of reasons why we might think that's the case. Um, feather mites eat bacteria, they eat fungus. They could eat bad bacteria, they could eat good bacteria. Um, bad bacteria would be feather degrading bacteria. But they also eat uropygial oil, which is the preen oil that birds use to, to waterproof their feathers. Um, and under different environmental conditions, all of those things vary. And so you can imagine a scenario where having feather mites could be good under certain conditions and having feather mites could be bad under other conditions. And so um, the idea is that those conditions are all changing 
those things are changing all the time. And, and the equilibrium between birds and feather mites might be disrupted by the future uh, climates that we are creating. Um, and so that's kind of indirect studies of climate change. Um, more mm -hmm. direct would be the, the perthonotary warbler size thing. Um, you know, one of the questions is, what, is climate change going to destroy these ecological patterns mm -hmm. that we ha are, have been around for a long time? Like larger things live in the North and smaller things live in the South. Will everything just become the same size? The North is warming a lot faster than the South. Eventually, you know, the benefits of being large in the North might not be there. Will birds evolve to become smaller? And there's already evidence that that's happening. Um, and then this egg thing, the South is mm -hmm. But yeah, so I mean, they're, they're not, so I don't study directly, but I think about it a lot with some of our work and the implications. Um, All right. Well, that, one one that, quick question, Tom. Oh. It's Gary. <laughs> Uh, are you going to be available for our Christmas uh, count in our area this year? <laughs> you know, it's a possibility. Um, Thon, we used to do I that learned, so many years together. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we, we I, I, some, I have great memories of us getting in uh, uh, cockle burr fights. During oh, the winter. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I actually, so I run a, I run a Christmas bird count down here at the White River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and it's like, this year it's December 19th. Um, the hope is, you know, I don't know, with COVID everything's crazy, but, I, but we do hope to come up there uh, for Christmas at least a little bit, but. Yeah, thank you very much, Don. I th I, I'm really happy the club has got to see some all the work you've been doing and you've got to sort of see a little bit of the club. Um, and I hope we can keep in touch over the coming years and just, you know, see what see what you I encourage people to go to your Facebook and your lab page and follow you and all that. And hopefully you'll uh, check in with us once in a while, too, and you come back and update us sometime. That'll be great. Sounds great, Steve. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for everyone for listening.